This is the Veteran Woman Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to empowering, inspiring, and encouraging veteran women to overcome their struggles and celebrate their successes. Now, here's your host, the one and only Ariel Renal. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Veteran Woman Podcast. Today, I have a very interesting interviewee, which I always have. But today I have Doretta Gadsden. 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 Y'all know I am bad with saying names. Sometimes (laughs) I get it right on point and sometimes I'm just tongue tied. So Doretta Gadsden. Right. (laughs) She has been a registered nurse for 23 years. And she is an Amazon best-selling author of the book, Living Victoriously, Strategies to Empower Women with a Chronic Diagnosis. Doretta is a graduate of Bronx Community College, and her passion is to empower women in realizing the power within to live their best life. Doretta has lived with AIDS for over 23 years and has a hunger to also educate women in making positive health choices. Doretta lives in New York with her family. So welcome, Doretta. Thank you. <laughs> so t- I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for what you do, because I know AIDS and HIV is an epidemic that still has shame behind it and people are still not willing to talk about it. Uh, many people probably do not know, but my mother has been living with HIV for over 20 years now. I'm not sure exactly when she was diagnosed, but I know when she got out of prison in 99, she had told me about it then. So, so you actually have full blown AIDS? Yes. What people don't understand. Could I explain that? Yes, please. That's what I was going to ask. People look at me all the time. I had a woman come up to me in church after I gave a speech and she said, Doretta, why do you keep saying you have AIDS? Look at you, you're healthy, you're vibrant, and on and on. I said, let me explain. When you are diagnosed with HIV and your T cells go below 200 and you start getting what we call opportunistic infections, which is shingles or PCP pneumonia or other things, you are diagnosed immediately with AIDS. And that diagnosis never goes away. Even though your T cells may go up, like mine's have, and you are undetectable. They can't find the virus in my system any longer. I look fine, but that diagnosis never goes away. So I I have AIDS no matter how long I live, which I plan to live a vibrant life to my 90s or 100, Mm -hmm. but I will always have an AIDS diagnosis. As far as the CDC is concerned, you never, that never is off your chart. That never goes away. You have it. Mm-hmm. Like I always tell any of my guests, if they're if I ask a question that you're not comfortable asking, I mean answering, mm-hmm. just let me know and we can skip over it. But right. and nothing that I ask is out of judgment; it's asking out of curiosity to dispel mm-hmm. any myths and just to advocate and get the the information out there so people know instead of getting it secondhand or gossip or whatever. So with that being said, so were you originally diagnosed with HIV? I was originally diagnosed with HIV in 93. And two weeks later, I was diagnosed with AIDS. Because when I was diagnosed, I was diagnosed by anonymous clinic. Then I went to my doctor, who's still my doctor today. So he took a lot. Now, we, we, when I went to him, I he knew, okay, she's, she has an HIV uh, anonymous test. So now I'm going to test her with her name. Mm-hmm. So at, when he did that, when my labs came back, my T cells, like I just said, were below 200. So right there, I had AIDS. Oh, and back wow. then, okay. right then, it was okay. The, the, the infections are going to start any minute. And within a month, I had TB. I had PCP pneumonia. A month after that, it's like I. It, it's almost like my brain couldn't handle the, the diagnosis. As long as I didn't know, I didn't get sick. But as soon as I knew. It's like my body started boom, 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 boom. One thing happened after another. I was in the hospital for like three months. And you know what? That's something else that scares people. I know that's something that keeps people from going to the hospital and getting diagnosis of any kind because they feel like they're okay. And then when they get that diagnosis, it's like the psychological affects the biological and like you feel like you got sicker when you may have been living with something and didn't know it. And 
It was like you were but okay. I'm, but I'm sure, I'm sure within a couple of months, I would have gotten sick anyway. Right. But because I, you know, I found out. So that's why I always say, I wonder if I would have. Yes, I would have. The body would have. It had started showing me little things. And as a nurse, I just kept looking. At what, I was like, this could, because I was working on the AIDS unit. And I was like, now this uh. could be. My locks had started changing. I was like, why is my locks thinning? This, of course, it had started taking effect already. It oh, just wow. had knocked me off my feet like it did. Like I was diagnosed in June. It had knocked me off my feet by October, wow. November, December. I was still in the hospital. So what gave you the courage and what were the signs to have you even get a test? I had just, if God works in your life. I'm going to just say that. Mm-hmm. I, saw, I, I had just graduated nursing school. As you can see, I'm a nurse 23 years and I was diagnosed 23 years. Right, Same. right. I got because I worked on the age unit. I worked in a hospital, Beth Israel, in Manhattan. I was a food service attendant. I was a nurse's aide, and then I became a nurse there. And so they gave me the. They had an opening on a small age unit, and now we don't have age units. That's discrimination today. Mm-hmm. But then we still had age unit, and I was excited. I was going to like change the world. I was going to heal everybody. Ooh. All these great ideas I had. Right. And so this supervisor came to us one day and said okay, all the new nurses have to be tested. And in my mind, I'm like, oh God, please don't do this. Not now. Because yeah. some 15 years earlier, not even 15, like 10 years earlier, I had been an IV drug abuser in the early 80s. All my friends had died. They had been dead. And that's what stopped me from shooting drugs because this fever, they didn't have a name then. It wasn't called AIDS. It was fever of unknown origin. And it was, it was killing all my friends or associates, I should say. And I knew that the only thing we had in common because some of them were rich, some of them were poor, some of them lived upstate, some of them lived in Long Island. But one thing we had in common was the place we shot drugs. So wow. I said, it's whatever they're calling this, it's in those needles because that's the only thing all of my friends have in common that are dying. So it made, I stopped shooting drugs and I never thought about it again. So fast forward some 10 to 93, now I'm standing here and she's telling me to get tested. And I'm like, dear God, please. Now, now I just graduated school. I got my life together. I have a nice apartment. Yeah, I have a good man. Everything is fine. That life is so bad. But it was, you know how a party you know yeah. knows, yes. you know? And it's like, I remember before Ariel, I went to get tested I pray. I'm, I'm a prayer and a meditator and a journaler. That's I do that daily. And I remember coming out of the meditation and, and God is in my soul. Like you have it, but you're going to be all right. And yeah. I told my girlfriend that was going with me, I got to go back into meditation because I'm hearing some stuff I don't want to hear. I need another, mm-hmm. I need another answer. <laughs> you know, like, I ain't listening to this meditation. Right, no right. way. But anyway, it was, you know, it, I was like, no, nah, I got to spend a couple more minutes. But, uh, you know, God is good. All He's the good. time. We do all the time. Wow. Uh, that's a fact. Yes. yes. And like mm-hmm. you said, looking at you, so dispel the myths of you look sick. No, you mm-hmm. don't. I mean, I, I didn't realize it because I just read your bio again. And then I was like, oh, she has AIDS? And I'm like, okay, we're going to talk about this because (laughs) just to look at you, like people think, oh, you can look and tell, but not necessarily. Oh, no, you can. And I Mm -mm. teach that in my talks. And then when I used to work at the AIDS clinic, trust me, you cannot talk. You You cannot tell. That's why I tell all the young women, this sweet talking person talking to you, do you... Ariel, I have counseled people in the, when I worked on the AIDS, in the AIDS clinic, they knew they had AIDS, knew they had HIV and still was sleeping with people, but they felt bitter. And because I, I, somebody gave it to them, they was going to give it give to it someone to else. else. And it's HIPAA. I can't just go and tell people, don't t- touch that, don't go with them because they have the virus. So you have to, in this damn time and all dance, I mean, really in this climate, people are angry. People are heartless and you have to protect yourself. You cannot see this coming. So do you have any, so for a person who doesn't know and who is afraid to get tested, are there any signs and symptoms ahead of time? There's all kinds of signs and symptoms. They're light though. They, they look, when you're first diagnosed, it almost feels like a fever or a cold. And then that only lasts for a short period, and then it goes away. You could live with HIV, HIV for years and not know and, it, and and just brush it off. And especially in 
if you're eating right, you're exercising, you're a healthy person, you can live years infecting people and not even know it. Let's say you're, you're a kind person, you would never harm anyone, but just you're not knowing because it's, it's, right. it's hidden. It's running around your bloodstream and you don't know. That's so scary. Oh, yeah. That's why it's important mm-hmm. to, to be safe. It's so important to be safe. And I tell people today, I mean, I had to wait when I was diagnosed. I had to, back then, 93, you had to wait two or three weeks. Mm-hmm. You can wait 20 minutes now. You could sit at your living room table and get something from the drugstore and have you and him or you and her or whoever and be tested together. Really? I did not know that. Yeah, oral swab. It's called oral swab or oral care or something. Uh-huh. I don't get the, the name escapes me right now. But Or you could go to a clinic and be swabbed. Within 20 minutes, you have the test. Oh, wow. Okay. See, I'm not really with that whole home thing because you have no support. True. You have no support True. after you're getting this thing that could alter your whole life. True. I had support. I had a powerful woman that just rerouted my whole way of, in that moment, had I gotten that from somebody that wasn't equipped to handle or mm-hmm. to talk to me. God is powerful. He puts the people that you need in your path. Mm-hmm. And I had the right person. In my book, I call her Susan. I had the right person that I needed. Cause I was like, are you kidding me? Even though God had told me a couple hours earlier that I had it. Remember I told you in the meditation, mm-hmm. I knew that, but I didn't want to hear that. Cause right. the, even the, the tester said, you know, you are positive. Oh no. She said, you're positive, but you knew that, right? Like, that's just how she said it to me because right. it was a checklist. And I had, you know, I had been a prostitute. I had been, mm-hmm. and not a prostitute that walked the street, streets, but I had slept with numerous men for money. Right. So that's a high risk. I had shot drugs. I had, you know, just so many things. But the only thing I wasn't, I always say, was a gay white man. I was everything else on the list. Wow. So she's like, you, you had to know you was positive. But I knew it in a way, but hearing it, sent me through a whole tunnel. You know how you see your life flashing Mm -hmm. in front of you? That's what I went through. So it pretty much sounds like you went through the stages of grief. That denial. Oh, (laughs) and one cent, and one minute. (laughs) (laughs) Like, you got to be kidding me, God. You got to be kidding me. You're not doing this to me. You done brought me too far. What the heck is this about? But see, you don't question God, because he's going to show you what... Because look how I'm blessing Mm -hmm. women now. Yes, yes. You know? People see me and they're like, what? Yes. You really stop. One person told me, stop joking. And so I rolled up my arms, my sleeves, and showed him the tracks. I said, look real close. You can't really see them unless you look close. These are not scars. They are tracks. He was wow. like, get the heck out of here. And it changed his whole way of looking at him being positive. Because he had watched wow. me take care of his mother for three years. Like, so he was crying in the corner. Of, I don't, I can't do pity parties. Because I don't been through too much, so please don't tell me about you. <laughs> no, I can't. Mm-mm, you can't tell me nothing. Because I can tell you about being sick. I can tell you what it takes to come out of it. Don't tell me you're feeling sorry for yourself. And you're in your 20s. You got your whole life. But to somebody that just hears that, yeah, they feel hopeless. It's the end of the world because that's, oh God, that's what we hear. We hear, mm-hmm. especially if we're still based on in the 80s when it first mm-hmm. became prevalent it's like mm-hmm. you've got hiv see, people, you've got aids your mm-hmm. life is done but see people still feel that way yes uh-huh i know they still they, my baby sister is passed because she she was contracted the virus from the her boyfriend she's not dead ariel because am i saying your name right ariel yes right? you are she's not dead ariel because of the virus she's dead because of the thought that this was running through her bloodstream oh. the fear or the stigma of this thing called it, even though she knew I had it. And I was living a vibrant life, working and nursing and traveling. Mm-hmm. And, uh-uh. It's, I got it. I don't care what Dora has. Me, I believe that kept my sister more than anything. Wow. The stigma of it. It's still crippling people. and wow. still making people feel like they can't share. So... Every time you say something, you you baffle me even more. I'm like, I'm like, like what you said, like, shut up, really? <laughs> so you talked about prostitution, sleeping with men for money. You talked about mm-hmm. drug abuse. How did you how did you get into it? Because I wanna how did you get into it so that people can understand how one day you think you're 
not this. And then another day you find yourself caught up in this kind of activity. And then right. how did you get out of that? Let's start with the prostitution part. Okay. Prostitution, let me go a little start with how I got on drugs. I was an incest survivor. And when you were, I don't know about everybody, but I felt that made me feel broken. It made mm. me feel less than, it made me feel little. Mm -hmm. It made me almost feel invisible and worthless. All of those things. Wow. And so I would hang out with people who use drugs and I never used, you know, I always watched them. And then one day I just started using it. And I've always, I always had up until a certain point, men in my life who took care of me, older mm -hmm. men. I was younger. They were older. They had jobs. They supported my habits. But then my habit escalated to a point and I didn't understand a habit. I thought I'm, I'm sick because I'm with this person that uses drugs. He, he had a good job, but he still shot drugs. Mm -hmm. So nobody knew we were addicts. So I thought if I get away from him, I'm gonna stop, I could, I, I'm gonna be well. It's like I was young, I didn't understand. I was right, in my early right. 20s, I didn't, I didn't get it. And so I left him and that, it just, it went, what was a tiny little snowball, mm -hmm. the snowball, snowball, snowball. And so now I wasn't with him to take care of my habit. I was sleeping with men that watched me grow up that own stores. So it's still prostitution. I'm not walking the street, but I'm sleeping with folk that I don't really want to sleep with who been watching oh. me since I was a little girl and would give me money. So I would just sleep with them, sleep with them and shoot my drugs. And then I met someone who was a trick and he, it was the weirdest thing. I was walking down the street. I was going to have another date. I want you to, I want you to know, Ariel, I never told this story like I'm telling it now. I always think, I appreciate how am I going to tell that part of my story? I have four grandsons and I always feel like my story will bless women. This part of the story that I'm telling you mm -hmm. is going to bless women, but how do I tell it and have my grandsons still respect me? But you know what? I have to tell it because it's starting to come out more and more. And pe women need to know that you are not the only one that did this and you can't come out of it. Right. And like I said, you okay. it, it, something always starts. You may think you're doing okay, or we may think it's something trivial or innocent. And then like you say, it just spirals out of control. And the next thing you know, a pimp is controlling you and... You, well, that you get locked. I, you get locked in. No, 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 no. It, it was never a pimp with or, me. I, I mean, with some, <laughs> with some, yeah, with right. some lady. With so, some of the, yeah, so that's, that's what true. I'm saying. It's different especially situations, when really, especially when they're really young. They get caught up so easily. So many, I know, so many women like that. Mm -hmm. I was too selfish to give somebody my money, honey. I know, I right? That's enough. what I. Said. <laughs> I was not. That's anyway. what I say. <laughs> so one day, I just was walking down the street on my way to to have a date. And my, uh, I call him an angel. In my book, I call him an angel. And he just started talking to me. And I was like, didn't want to be bothered because I was on my way to somebody else who I knew how much money I was going to get for. You know, mm -hmm. I knew him. I knew this is my Thursday night date. I'm going, and who are you? So, but he kept trying. And so he pulled out all this money. He was new to this country and so naive. So he pulled out all of this money. And so I took these, I took what I needed. And I said, oh, come on, let's go to, to my room. And he just kept coming to see me and telling me, he would just tell me, Ariel did. I say in my, in my book that he saw me under all the drugs, on, under the disheveled me, under the nappy hair, under the anger. He saw me. The person that sits here in front of you, how, mm -hmm. do, how he saw that, I don't know. But he would come to my house and just preach, not preach, but just say, Doretta, you don't, you bigger than this. Why are you doing this to your arms? What's wrong? You, mm -hmm. you could be so much more. And I said, who the heck are you? And get out. I'm trying to get out. Right. Because <laughs> you, then and then was, always, already you didn't trust anybody. So exactly. it's probably was like, whatever. He's just talking get some out. more stuff. Get yeah. Out. Get out. Right. And then one day I just was in the bed. I remember thinking, I like that guy. He's so nice. He's not just somebody that comes to sleep with me for money. He's a friend. And so I just started really spending time with him and listening to him. And he told me over and over, year after year, you got to get an education. So if I die, you won't have to go back to where you've been. And I'm going to nursing school. And here I am, long story short, wow. because of him. Wow. Mm -hmm. I'm married to somebody else because, you know, our, our life evolved. But he was an angel on a path to get me he, to another place. He was right on time, like you said. Oh, yes. 
Yes, for sure. Wow. So that's how I got in it, in it and that's how I got out of it. Amazing, amazing. Mm-hmm. So what do you have to say to women nowadays, women and men, when it comes to prostitution, drugs, and then the diagnosis, and just overcoming obstacles in general? And I have, a, I'll tell you later on, it's a, a little ebook that I have about overcoming obstacles. But what I have to say is, no matter what you go through, I went through all of that because of what my father did to me. I felt like if the one person in my life who was supposed to protect me didn't, then I'm, I'm dope, I'm, I'm nothing, I'm, I'm worthless. I want people to believe that they are special that the sick person was the person that abused you, be it sexually, be it verbally, be it emotionally, be it whatever, it's them. But we internalize them. So I encourage people, try to surround yourself and reach out to people who who see you, who see that the goodness, the God in you, like this man saw in me, or like my counselor Maggie saw in me. God always put people in me to get me through the next level, always. Mm-hmm. He did it when I was a young girl. He did it with my with my friend that got me off drugs. He he does it with friends that I have now to stretch me in my business. It's like just believe in yourself. It's not easy. I'm, I know this sounds like I'm just saying this, but it's one baby step at a time. Just see yourself how you want to see, not how they told you you are or not how they treated you, but how you, when you're quiet and you see that, because we all see the other part of ourselves. Mm-hmm. Like I saw the the me that I see today. I saw her when I got when I was getting high. I just didn't know how to get out of the trap of drug addiction. Mm. I didn't know how to get out of the trap of depression because the depression is what started me to getting high. Right, self medicating. Yeah, when mm-hmm. I was high, I was invincible for right. a period of time, and then it grabs you by your throat and you in it. Mm-hmm. But for a minute, you feel like nothing can harm you. Mm-hmm. You could do almost anything. So I just, I encourage people to surround yourself with positive people. Pray. God has been, I mean, what started my whole journey was me and this little green Bible. Who oh, I can't even read the words of that Bible today. It's so little. <laughs> it's tiny, tiny. I was like, dear Lord, did I once read this one? How? <laughs> But yes, indeed, that was my safeguard. I was sitting in the shooting galleries and just praying. And one day I was sitting in the corner of the shooting gallery and God told me, um, you're just passing through. Just be patient. Hmm. You're passing through. You're going to come out of this. I didn't know how, but in a couple of weeks, I met my friend. How did this not shake your faith? Or did it? It didn't. I always had hope. I just didn't see how. And that's what something I want to say to people. You may not see how it's going. He's going to do it. Because I didn't see my friend coming in my life and talking to me and putting me through nursing school and me buying a co-op. I didn't see all of this. Mm-hmm. I just saw how am I ever going to have a See, we have little baby thoughts. How am I ever going to get another apartment? That was mm-hmm. my thought. I'm living with my grandmother. I'm living with my aunt. I'm shooting drugs. How am I going to get out of this? I didn't see him getting me to helping me get myself together, me getting a job, me having enough money to go to a rehab in Minnesota. Who the heck saw that sitting in the shooting gallery? Mm. I didn't. So we're not going to see where he's taking us. And he's going to take us to some big places that we didn't even think about. Right. Me in Minnesota in a rehab? Who would have thought of that? Minnesota? I never thought twice about Minnesota. (laughs) What? (laughs) Minnesota? I don't know what the heck you're talking about. (laughs) But God is good and he'll take you places you, I mean, that's not a million dollars, but that's a million dollars to me. I'm a whole different woman today. Wow. Wow. Amazing. How did you get the courage to share your story? Ariel, it was almost like I had to. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. For so many years, I didn't because of family members not wanting me to. Mm-hmm. And like um, mm-hmm. two age worlds day ago, two November 1st or December 1st ago. I was like, I wouldn't care who I can't stay, who won't be, who he can't handle it. I can't listen to me. I'm talking about this in church on Sunday. Mm, and in I church? Did, and I, oh, what? People were mouth hung open. Her, wow. my, my, my pastor, her, her blood pressure was up. She was like, are you sure you want to do this? I was like, give me a break. You know how many people sitting in here with it? 
and you, you will never Thank know. You. Thank you. You know how many people got relatives who are ashamed, they shame to talk about it? That same woman that came up to me and said, Jovetta, you don't have AIDS, had a husband with it. You think people in that church knew that but me? Nope. So you see how people living in the shadows and my coming out frees them. Yes, yes, I agree. And I if, agree. from what I believe is our experiences, be it the incest that I talk about, be it the drug addiction, be it the sleeping with men for money, be it AIDS, all of those valleys, it's people that I'm here to serve. And this, my story serves all those people. And if I keep silent, none of them are free. And it helps free you too. Oh, for sure. It helps free you from the shame. Because if you already talk about you having AIDS, nobody can use that against you. Oh, for Because sure. you're oh, already yeah. sharing it. People, you're like, yeah, people know that. I share that. So let me tell you about the rest of my story. I commend you. Wow, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's God, it's God, it's God, it's God. I don't it's, even I know what to ask. I think this is the first time I've been dumbfounded because you've shared so much within only a few minutes. <laughs> and like you said, you <laughs> never know what a person has gone through until you take the time to sit down and talk to them. True. And you That's can't true. judge somebody based on one little piece that you've heard. You and can. all of us are dealing with something. All of us have all some of kind us. of skeletons in our closet or whatever, mm -hmm. or we know somebody that does. And, and like you mentioned earlier, AIDS doesn't have a class, a creed, a race or whatever, because depending on how doesn't. you get it, like you said, you were shooting up drugs with affluent people. Mm -hmm. People wouldn't have known. And a lot of them passed away from it. Mm -hmm. So it's important to get yourself checked. It's important to be safe. And just like you said, get around that community that can help bring you up and uplift you so that you're able to share that story and live a healthy life because you've lived a long over two decades with it. Right. And mm -hmm. back in the day, that was unbelievable. It we, was. Used to, we used to feel like in 23 days after a diagnosis, it's over. Is over. Let alone 23 years. I've, I've always had the mindset, and I think it was my walk with God, my um, my being a unity student and unity, we believe in the power of God within us and what we speak and believe um, we can make happen. And I always vo voiced and put out into the universe that I would live to see the end of this epidemic. Mm. Healthy, not just sickly, but healthy. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. Anybody that didn't see that wasn't a part of my circle. Be it family members, be it friends. If you wasn't a person that couldn't if, see people in my life, I think they forget I have it because you you better or you can't be in my life. It can't be a a conversation. Right. It can't be a big conversation. Now, if I need to teach or if you want to talk, but you know, how are you today? My family forgets, I believe, unless it come up in their life and then they use me as an example. Right. My, like my daughter is taking a class now. So she was like telling people, oh, let me tell you about it. And she was giving tips and all of that. <laughs> and it was like, how you know all that? She was like, well, my mother lives with it. Mm. Now, see, because my family is like so open and so, but I have other family members a little more, a little more closed. Mm -hmm. But uh, you got to ride with me, honey. Take a deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> So, be okay. <laughs> so can you dispel some myths that you normally hear or that are still lingering out there? You could get it by shaking hands. You could get it by eating after somebody. If you could get it after shaking hands and eating, we would all have it because you eat in restaurants. You, I guarantee you, everybody listening to your podcast have someone in their life, a couple of people in their life and in their family to have it, but they will never share it because of the stigma. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't get it by, in, the only ways you get AIDS, HIV, let's talk about HIV, because people today don't have to progress to AIDS. There's too many medications out. The only way you get it is through breast milk, IV drug abuse, sharing um, like needles, mm -hmm. uh, intercourse, that's anal or vaginal. Those are the ways it's trans, transmuted, and, like I said, blood transfusions. But the blood transfusions are clean now. 
they're right. tested. They're not going to give you blood that's not tested. Right. Those are the only ways you get it. But people still think, oh, you kiss them, if you touch them, right. if you drink after them. If that was the case, I have so many people in my house Thanksgiving and Christmas. I cook both days, and this house is full. People will be scared to come up in here right. if they if that was true. If my house is full every every holiday. So I thank God for people who are intelligent, who yeah. are knowledgeable, right. who are open to love me. You know, and and I do understand that everybody knows to have a family and friends like that. I had a friend who's passed because her family gave her one salsa, one one plate, one cup, and that's all she could use, one fork and spoon, and they kept it in a separate area. How ignorant! But they didn't know any better. They were so fearful. But could you imagine living under that? That I can't. That doesn't help. That doesn't help you it mentally. Does not. And it when does you're not. broken down mentally and emotionally, that becomes psychosomatic, and that it gives yeah. way for that disease to just to take over even more. And the depression, yes. you know, that it, it, it just make that even worse. You feel so isolated. But if so many people still would go through that, I have a friend. She's a pharmacist. Her family doesn't know. I'm like, I'm so open. I can't keep a secret like that. I just can't. I don't know how to do that. Because of shame and stigma. Uh, yeah. I do understand why they do it because everybody's not going to understand. Yeah. You know, I have patients. I'm a visiting nurse. Everybody's not going to understand. They just And not. the fear, of, you know what? I think it's the fear of being isolated, like you're saying. Mm-hmm. The yes. fear that if they come out and tell somebody that they're going to lose that friend, they're going to lose that family member, people start treating them differently. When in exactly. all reality, you teach those people, you advocate, you bring awareness to it, and they, if they still decide to be ignorant, then you got to find a new group of people who will support yes. you and be there for you and lift you up instead of tearing you down. And that's exactly. hard. That, I mean, that, that is, easily said, is. but that's hard when you have to separate from some family and friends. Yes, it is. It is. But you got to you gotta look to at your me, cycle. It's about being true to yourself, mm-hmm. being real with your life. Do you choose you or do you choose them? Yeah. Like when I came out, it was like everybody could walk out this room. I don't care. I have to be here with me and I have to be OK with me. And I believe God brought me through all those things that I talked about earlier, the incest, the drug abuse, the, the prostitution, whatever. He brought me through all of that to this place to reach back, not to sit mm-hmm. in silence. That would be a waste. Yeah. It would be a waste yeah. for me. Now, other people are not that brave, not that outgoing. And I do get, I do know people like that. And I, I respect their path. Mm-hmm. You know, I really do. So you mentioned earlier that you have an ebook about overcoming obstacles. Do you have a link for that? I do. It's called, it's a, a part of my website, but I want them to go to www.womenwillbloom.com slash resources. And they could just opt in there. And it's the five daily habits, the five daily actions for the newly diagnosed woman. But after that, they get these five actions for overcoming adversity. They not get like a little bundle. Okay. They get a lot of stuff in it. Yeah. Okay. So what other services um, or programs do you offer for women who are living with a diagnosis or even just need to work through overcoming any kind of obstacle? I do one-on-one and group coaching. Right now I'm doing just one-on-one, but in a month or so I'm going to start my group coaching again. And cuz I my life is about helping women come where come through what I just came from. Mm-hmm. I believe that I have this diagnosis. I live with it for a reason, like I said. I know how it is to be sick. I know how it is to be fearful. I know what it feels like to feel judged. I know what it feels like to have somebody touch you where you don't want to be touched and where they shouldn't. And I believe I, I, it's my duty to hold a sacred space for other women that's walking that path. And how else can we contact you? Oh, uh, my website is womenwillbloom.com. Mm-hmm. Or you, and my name is Doretta Gaston. My email, dorettagaston, gmail.com. Okay. And are you on social media? Oh, definitely. I have, I have a group which is live, um, living victoriously on Facebook, and you can get, you can just friend me at Doretta Gaston, 
I'm doing better gassing everywhere. Okay. Twitter. Yeah. Good, Facebook. Good. So it's pretty easy to find. YouTube. You. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I'm everywhere. All right. I'm everywhere, real open. You, you see my YouTube videos. I do classes on living with AIDS. I do classes on, and I have a, a I have my book uh, with living victoriously. It's on Amazon, or you can get it, you can just email me, and I can send you an autographed copy. Or I also have a book coming out. I'm a part of an anthology with Cheryl Pellot Williamson called okay. Soul Source. Mm-hmm. And it's coming out in July. I'm excited about that. She invited me to be a part of this really great group of women. It's 23 of us. And my section is about living with depression and how to, I call it dance with it. I've lived with it all my life, but I've danced with it. I know mm-hmm. how to handle it. And in the book, I share with how I live with it a day at a time. Some days it's not here and some days it comes and sit right next to me. Uh-huh. But I still get on with my day. It's like I give it a couple of minutes, now I'm getting up. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> four, I'm going to give it a month. And like, okay, I can't get out. I can't get in the shower. No, I'm not doing that today. So I just share in, in that section of the book, Soul Source. It's coming out in July. And I shared in my regular, my uh, living victorious too. Because anybody that's going through illness is going to feel depressed. Your life is threatened. Your quality of life, as you have known it, is threatened. Mm -hmm. You hear any diagnosis, diabetes, AIDS, renal failure, you know, cancer, immediately you go into a shock. Mm -hmm. Like, and your life is, as you know it, you start to feel like you're not going to, and you start playing the tapes of all the people that you know that had AIDS. Mm-hmm. Or all the people that you know that had diabetes and lost their limbs and their eyesight. Mm-hmm. And my message is, you don't have to live that path. I was determined not to entertain that I had to die like my 30 other friends. My walk with God is totally different. I'm here to do some work. I don't know why they died. I knew I had some work to do. Mm-hmm. And I invite people to, when they're diagnosed, please don't entertain what everybody else experienced and get away from all the people to tell you about their signs and symptoms and they, they're, uh, they're losing their limbs and they can't feel their feet because they have diabetes or they can't breathe or whatever. No. It you doesn't have to be, be around you. people. No Don't way. Claim it. Don't claim child, please. I got away from the people so fast. I'll tell you I couldn't do it. I had I left a 12-step program. I was in recovery, but everybody in there in New York was dying of AIDS. And so everybody was looking at me like I was next. And I was like, you know what? I'm getting out of here. Mm. I'm getting away from this. I will stay clean another way. And that's when I found Unity Church. I was like, I will stay clean another way. Just a, d- if I stay here, I'm going to feed into what they feel. Mm-mm, not going to do it. Amen. Thank you so, so much for sharing. Thank you for all the services and the coaching that you provide, the talks that you provide, because it is so important to get the word out, especially with something so highly stigmatized and so highly fearful and shameful. I thank you for turning and, ma- and creating a new face on it to show that you can live healthy for decades, regardless of what you may have been diagnosed with, regardless of what they may say, and regardless of even what you may have seen your friends or family go through, you can live through all this. Cause I'm telling you, you are a perfect example of overcoming obstacles because it's not just one or two. You've gone through a gamut of things. And as you sit here in front of me, I can see your strength and you have empowered me. And you have this matter of fact, like, uh, uh-uh, uh, that ain't me. And come on, let's move out of it. No, pity parties yeah we have bad days but hey there's hope there's hope above all so i thank you thank you so much for sharing it thank you for answering the questions and being so open (laughs) sure and thank you for inviting me i love this i haven't done this in a couple of months (laughs) and uh it was it's been a pleasure thank you (laughs) thank you you've been listening to the veteran woman podcast If you want to connect with Ariel and let her know what you thought of today's show, be sure to head over to www.theveteranwoman.com and follow her on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Veteran Woman. 